Hello, it's Seb. I hope you're warm. I hope you're well. I'm here to bring you my top reads from 2023. I'm going to start off with a sort of honorable mention of uh, Tova Janssen's Finn Family Moomin Troll, which uh, it just feels wrong to not put my annual Tova Janssen read on my top book uh, lists uh, at, at the end of the year. Um, so I'm going to put it there, even though this was a four stars. Um, it's the third Moomin book that I've read and it's the first one to not be in the sort of like sacred five star category. Um, it was still really 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 good though, like it had me crying like one chapter in, two chapters in. The reason why it didn't quite make that sort of golden tier is because um, the, the, well, the first two ones, it's about Moomin Troll, this uh, little hippo looking creature going, uh, that's, that's not him, that's him uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the cloud on his back. Uh, but yeah, he's going on a, a, a journey. So in the first one, it's like with his mother trying to find a home um, and like kind of make a home in the world. Um, and in the second one, it's because there's a big comet that's going to crash into the, the home that they found. So it, they go to an observatory. It's a sort of there and back again story to try and find out um, what they can do. And both of those, there's a sense of like one big adventure and movement and threat. Like, um, yeah, and either in the form of dangers along the way or, or a big comet that's coming to destroy you. Um, in this one, this is more like kind of what my image of the movements was before I started reading them, which is that they're all just hanging out um, in, in, in Moomin Valley and a year kind of passes, I think a bit less than a year actually, so you kind of, you move with the seasons, which is very nice and it's actually more like the other non-Moomin adult uh, Toby Jansen book I've read, the summer book, in that it's just people, that was just people hanging out on an island and kind of like making small observations about life as you know, and it's a relationship between a grandmother and her grandchild as like, yeah, like seasons pass and like small incidents come and go, um, but it's kind of about the characters. Um, and this is also very character focused, which is again why it's, it's brilliant. Um, Toby Anson writes sort of like these little psychological nuances between her characters and gives them such distinction in just a few like sentences. And um, the illustrations are, are great. Um, as always, there's even like a little map this time around, which you can use to kind of, they go on little adventures, but they always kind of, you know, they don't amount to much. The thing that unites this story, there's like one incident, there's a magic hat that they find, which if you put things in, then they turn into other things. Um, and so that's, that ends up being kind of threatening as well. And kind of like, sometimes there's a bit of body horror in this as well, when somebody actually wears the hat for a bit and that's all good and everything. It just didn't like stab me in the way that the first uh, Moomin books did, but I still really loved it. I love the characters. I love Snork Maiden the most. And um, I'm, I'm going to carry on with the, the series, obviously. Um, next, well, now we're moving into the five star kind of area and not all of these are books. So I like, I'm calling them my top reads of the year because this first one, um, it was an audio, like, well, it wasn't an audio book. It's like a radio play, like a radio dramatization of the day of the Triffids by John Wyndham. And I'm not including rereads either on this list. Um, just because like some, some of my top reads were actually rereads this year, but this is not really a reread, I feel, because although I did read this book ages and ages ago, this radio dramatization, like what made it so great was the way that it had been adapted as an audio format. There's one night when suddenly all these beautiful lights appear in the sky, um, all the world stays up to, to watch the, the beautiful lights, and then the next morning everybody has gone blind. Um, I don't know how this works for time zones. I presume, yeah, the lights must have, like, appear across a number of days maybe. Everybody goes blind on Earth and then society starts collapsing, especially because it's like the combination of everybody going blind and the fact that in this uh, version of history, there's this sort of uh, carnivorous plant called the Triffid, which is usually kind of fine, like we keep them and we farm them for oil or something like that. Um, but then once everybody goes blind, they start escaping and they've got lethal stings on them. So um, like kind of like a tendril that can whip out and, and poison you and kill you quickly. Uh, so yeah, then they start like kind of taking over and it's like this sort of zo like the, the zombie apocalypse genre I think basically comes from this book even though there aren't any zombies in it It's just like it's got all those vibes like if you like Walking Dead and stuff like that This is all about that like kind of the, the main thing isn't the zombies or the plants The main thing is the sort of how do people band together and reform civilization um, from from little tribal groups um, and it's it's really good and the, yeah the way that it works so well is the audio in this one like the often the main character has to he, he can see but he also has to like kind of move blind people around so he always has to 
describe visually what's going on often in like extremely intense moments when there's somebody with a gun and he's saying like the man with the gun is behind the tree and the, so like when you're listening to it you feel like you're one of the blind people having to completely rely on your sense of, of sound to survive in this world so it's incredibly immersive it's also got these amazing 1960s BBC radiophonic workshop uh, noises going on in the background so you also feel like you're uh, in the 1960s in the UK sci-fi kind of world which is exactly where I want to be most of the time so so yeah, I'm not counting it as a reread because it was really specifically this audio adaptation thing which really made it just like a wonderful experience this year. Um, now I'm moving on to a novel, Poison for Breakfast by Lemony Snicket. This one is like, uh, well, it begins with the fictionalized author himself, Lemony Snicket, having breakfast and then finding a note or, or no, like there's a, where does he find the note? There's a knock on the door or something. Anyway, he finds a note which says you've been poisoned and so he realizes he's had poison for breakfast and then the rest of the, the book is him trying to find out uh, what to do, what poisoned him, is there a cure and so on. This is a sort of philosophical book for kids and adults which is something I find really intriguing and uh, difficult to pull off. I haven't read many examples um, that work, I think. Like one that people often say is The Little Prince as a book which is great for kids and adults. I think it's really for adults, um, sort of disguised in, in, in a kid's uh, kind of like language and that sort of simplicity. But I think the, a lot of it is, doesn't really um, like work if it's targeted towards kids or at least like they miss a lot of what makes it good. Um, and and like, likewise, there's often books which are billed as both, but for adults, they don't quite get the most out of it, whereas the kid does. So I think it's really difficult to make one which, which kind of is, um, you know, uh, philosophically intriguing at different levels of development and I don't think this one quite gets it either like it's really uh, light-hearted and dark um, and kind of sly in the way that like you know his, his uh, what was it series of unfortunate events uh, was um, and I think that it kind of would probably work for a really specific age group that I don't know exactly what it is but I do feel like it's probably too difficult or boring for some kids and like maybe a little bit too childish for teenagers and some some adults as well like he often explains long words um, to, and he does it in a way which is kind of funny um, but also I think a bit alienating if you already know what the word means you kind of feel like this book was written for someone else um, but those are like kind of the, the really small niggles um, that I have with it because I really obviously love this book that's why it's on this list um, it was such a surprise I haven't read Lemony Snicket since I was very small and like um, I, I don't know what I expected going into this but I think the reason it works so well is because he's got this parameter of the story of trying to find out what happened um, how he got poisoned and he's you know just walking around his local neighborhood and trying to find out like where he got the food from um, and like how it might have gotten poisoned so it's all kind of contained by that story and also the theme of bewilderment the sort of self-stated theme of bewilderment because he writes often um, about the fact that he's writing and about writing in general so it's got the plot and it's got the theme of bewilderment kind of containing it and then from that he goes off in all sorts of different directions um, like cognitively and just thinks of different concepts like writing is one of them but he also talks about God and uh, morality um, he has a whole chapter just on supermarkets as well which was like a brilliant chapter he talks about suffering in like many different forms including loneliness and uh, fear of death uh, prison camps he talks a lot about for some reason um, and uh, yeah there's just like a lot in there and it's quite a short book um, but it feels like you're going off on this great journey of the mind. It also has lots of just fun observations about life and language. Um, like, for example, there's one about um, the expression, not my finest hour, that the writer keeps coming back to this expression because he says that as a child, he always um, used to feel that the idea of a finest hour meant that somewhere in your life, there was just one hour which is like he says you're shining 60 minutes and then wondering about that hour of your life, the actual best part of your life, like what, what would that would entail for it to be your best hour, your finest hour, um, maybe it's already passed and like he talks about the finest hour a lot um, and he uses things like that, you know, like little kind of quirks of language to go off on these um, big thoughts, which is I think what kind of fun philosophy should be, this kind of armchair philosophy at least, which is what he's talking about and he does actually talk about the western tradition a little bit um which is also you know 
in very accessible language and that's all very impressive. I would say this was my biggest surprise probably of the year um, in terms of like how how great I thought this book was. Um, the second one is not a book, it's a short, sto short story? No, it's um, letters from, from this one, but this was also a huge surprise for me and just how much I connected with it. Um, this was uh, Letters from London uh, from the collection The Tower of London by Natsume Soseki. Uh, the collection is actually not, he didn't edit it, it's been edited by this guy Damien Flanagan who's also the translator. Um, and it's just all of the things that this Japanese writer wrote when he went to London in the year, I don't remember the year, it was uh, the like, kind of Meiji period, so like 18 hundreds uh like turn of the century i think yeah yeah beginning of like 1900s um and he is sent to london um by the tokyo university and he hates it he has a really terrible time there but he writes letters back um and then when he eventually went back to japan after his time in london he wrote a novel and he became like the kind of father of um, modern Japanese literature um, like and was incredibly successful and is still seen as like that kind of giant of, of literature. So for me like I wanted to get into this like kind of really famous Japanese writer and I just saw this on the shelf in the library and I thought like oh yeah Tower of London I've been there um, be interesting to see something kind of autobiographical. I've also been getting into memoirs and stuff which I didn't used to like, but since last year, it's been something I've been interested in. He was the same age as me, I think, or around that when he was in London, which was a nice surprise. And also um, a lot of things I could relate to in the sort of feeling of being in a different country and a lot of his observations about differences between Western and um, English culture and Japanese culture are interesting in the way that some of them have like stayed completely relevant to today and some of them aren't at all. Like um, one of the things is the underground. He talks about um, like going like on the tube around London and how horrible it is and how he does and he feels like it's wrong for humans to be like kind of shuttled around in these underground tunnels and he compares it to, to Tokyo where they don't have that kind of system but obviously they do now right um, and lots of the things that he he makes these comparisons where sometimes it holds true and sometimes it doesn't he also goes into like racism that he experiences and the street which is just like fascinating to hear like from a modern perspective there's also the gender dynamic like the way he sees women is interesting because he feels sort of um, superior as a man in a sort of misogynistic way but also inferior as Japanese in a sort of internalized racist way um, and and yeah he discusses all of this with like a kind of a really interesting frankness um, and this sort of wry sarcasm and wit so yeah the sort of the historical elements um, and the familiar elements of, of like going walking around London which is you know something I've done many times um, is, is really like attractive for me but also the sort of really uh, he's quite bitter and unhappy, but fun and wry and uh, yeah, the, the voice is just like um, really fun. And the kind of the sense of reading a historical document also somehow made this really great and unexpectedly like kind of thrilling because um, reading in the notes, like little bits and pieces, you, you can kind of put together the, like, the fact that um, the person that he's writing to was a really famous haiku poet at the time who encouraged him to like keep writing stuff about London while he was there um, and keep writing fiction. Um, and he didn't do that really. But then um, the, the correspondent, um, Masao Kashiki, died of tuberculosis. Um, and so when he went back to Japan, um, Natsume Soseki decided he would write a sort of fiction, a short story to make up for the fact that he hadn't written before for his dead friend. And that short story was the one that then became so incredibly popular, he was sort of forced to turn it into a novel because everybody wanted to read it in Japan. Um, and so, yeah, then he, you know, his career begins. So the fact that like these letters kind of hold the seeds of everything that's going to happen to him and, you know, the huge kind of shifts that are going to happen in Japanese literature, thanks to his writing, is just like really exciting because he's obviously just talking about how like kind of shitty the weather is and stuff like that. So like kind of you're looking for clues, well, at least I was looking for clues as well um, in that in that sense. Um, and, and yeah, it was just like really surprising and great read. I'm not sure I mentioned that I'm doing these in chronological order. Like this is a sort of like countdown to the best one. Um, so yeah, so this is number four and the next one, number three, I don't have with me, but it's also uh, kind of like letters. It's poetry. Um, it's the Tristia by Ovid, which I did a big video on. Um, and so like, if you want to hear more about it, you can go there. But basically, um, one of my favorite writers, uh, the Roman poet Ovid, got exiled uh, to the very like edges of the empire, like on the coast of the Black Sea, 
which at the time was this sort of like, you know, there were lots of uh, like Celts and tribes of people. So it's a totally different world. For, for Ovid, it was like pure barbarianism that he was, he'd been sent to. Um, and so he's writing poems and sending them back to Rome. And he's writing them often in the forms of letters, either to his wife or his friends or his enemies or the emperor, um, Augustus, who's the one who exiled him. And the poems are uh, like the story, like the, 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 the collection is called Tristia, which is translated as either like lamentations or I've seen it also as just sad songs, which I really like. Um, but yeah, he's just very sad and he's complaining all the time and he's bringing lots of allusions and comparisons to Greek mythology. Again, the voice is really what makes this. And this also kind of connects not only to Natsume Soseki's uh, kind of version of himself that he puts in his letters, um, like experiencing London, um, like Stranger in a Strange Land, but also back to the um, Poison for Breakfast one, because Ovid, like the real Ovid and the kind of fictionalized Ovid are obviously two different people, and the fictionalized version of himself that he's writing um, has an aim, which is he wants to get recalled back to Rome. So he's obviously twisting the truth in various ways um, to try and persuade uh, people and like you the reader as well that he should be brought back to Rome that his exile should be revoked or at least he should be but like towards the end he starts changing realizing that he's not getting any success he kind of changes a little bit his his terms of argument and says he just wants to be moved somewhere uh, a little bit more hospitable um, and warmer probably because it's very cold there so yeah trying to find like the line between the poet and the the fictional version of himself that he's making um, and the world like you know the, the actual world and the fictional world that he's making of, of, of his of his lot in life is really fun um, at least I really enjoyed it and also the kind of the antagonism between him and the Emperor the relationship that he builds through his words um, between like himself the, the the exiled poet and the Emperor the most powerful person uh, probably in the world at that time right um, and like the personality that he kind of builds and the way that he has to do it through sort of begging to be brought back but at the same time he's obviously so bitter and angry um, and that and like that's kind of planted in everything that he, he writes. The whole collection was brilliant um, and there's a second part to it called Letters from the Black Sea which I'm really looking forward to reading in the future. Um, so now number two this is a short story not a book at all this was from a big collection of Japanese short stories and I just saw that there was one I hadn't read before by Aktagawa Ryunosuke, who is one of my kind of super people in terms of like anything he writes is just perfect as far as I'm concerned. So I thought, okay, let's see what it is, let's see how it goes. And it was actually like maybe the most perfect short story I've ever read, or at least it kind of felt that way at the time, um, which I don't know, it's called um, Autumn Mountain. It begins with these two guys, like kind of, I think in the Edo period in Japan, sitting down for tea. They talk about this painter and one of them says, have you heard of this painting, The Autumn Mountain? And he says, no, I haven't heard of that. And he says, yeah, it's like, it's me meant to be actually his best one, but not many people have heard about it, but it's meant to be one of the most beautiful things ever painted. And um, he says, oh, have you, have you seen it yourself? And he says, that's the thing. I'm not sure if I have seen it or if I haven't seen it because of this weird experience that I had. And so he's like, that's odd, please explain. So he says, all right, well, if you have the time, he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So then they sit down and then it kind of the story begins. And we go between the story of the painting and then like keep like flitting back to the two people having tea and like occasionally somebody asks a question about the story and like, um, it's just the structure and it's very simple um, about beauty and about painting and about like beauty in the eye of the beholder and that kind of thing. Often I find that I'm most impressed by things when my expectations are sort of low or neutral when like going into them. Um, and I think that was maybe the case with uh, Poison for Breakfast as well. Um, but when it, when it came to this one, The Autumn Mountain, I was like stunned because my expectations were already so high going in, like thinking, oh, this is the guy who writes kind of perfect short stories, so this should be pretty good, right? Um, and then reading it and having my expectations like met to the T, like was in itself like really, I don't know, impressive and astounding. I didn't feel just like, oh yeah, another perfect short story. It was like, wow, he really can do it. Like every time, just knock it out of the park. But yeah, Akta Garinosuke, absolute legend. And now number one, and we're sticking with Japan for this one. Um, but uh, this was a, this is kind of almost cheating. And I, I kind of knew I would have this problem um, back in, 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 when did I start this? In spring, I started reading this book. Um, and I decided I was gonna take one year, like read a chapter every month for the 12 chapters in the book. Um, but almost instantly, like from the first chapter, I felt this is gonna be one of my favorite books. So it's gonna be on that end of year list. 
um, but maybe I shouldn't put it there because I won't have completely finished the book. But um, it's, it's Territory of Light by Tsushima Yuko. And the reason that it is on the list is um, partially because it's so brilliant. Every chapter has been wonderful. And, you know, I've read up to the December. So there's only January, February and March left. So I've read most of it. But also it's the way that it's written um, and the kind of the way that the story unfolds. It's about a mother raising, like she separates from her partner um, and her husband actually and she's got uh, a kid and they're living together they get an apartment and they're living in the apartment and like kind of it's the story begins with them um, renting the apartment um, and then like the the rest of it is oh she says yeah like this is one I stayed in the apartment for one year so this is like the story of their life in the apartment and um, it's 1970s Japan so there's lots of pressure to like not get divorced and stuff like that like there still is today but I guess it's a bit more um, then it's kind of depressing how little has changed actually um, not just in Japan but in, in general and sort of like the, the difficult difficulties she has to face but yeah the way the chapters work are just like kind of moving through the seasons and um, also like her her mood shifts are what kind of change the story more than plot actions so I feel like I'm just kind of living with uh, she doesn't have a name by the by the way the unnamed narrator and her daughter like, I feel like I'm just kind of living with them and every month I check in on them to see how they're doing. Um, and it doesn't really feel like if the story had just stopped now, like if I couldn't read the last three chapters for whatever reason, I would still feel like a sort of completion, I guess, because it doesn't feel like it's leading towards anything uh, in particular. It was serialized um, so that like every uh, chapter was like a short story, basically, um, in a magazine. Um, so like and, and serialized like once per month right so it really does just feel like life moving on and of course I don't want it to end because it's perfect but also I feel like if it ended now it would still be like one of the best the best book I read uh, in, in, in 2023 um, so yeah Territory of Light um, Tsushima Yuko I will obviously talk about it again when I've actually finished it um, although that's not gonna happen till next spring it's been so nice having something which is just consistently brilliant um every month <laughs> um and just knowing that oh yeah i'm gonna go back to that book and the chapter will probably be really good again some are better than others um but then again like kind of life is also not always consistently one thing so that it's it's it, it makes sense and um i don't know the writing style really really works for me it's very dreamlike she often opens with like a dream and then wakes up from the dream and then on the other chapters it ends with it going into the dream and the last one I read, the December one, it, um, it opens in a situation where she is uh, filing for divorce and so she's like kind of in a room and there's loads of people and she has to wait her turn and she's got the ticket so it feels already, oh I, I'm in a dream, I'm in sort of some sort of Kafkaesque nightmare um, but then as it goes on I was like, oh wait no no this is actually real life now so there's a lot of that kind of blurring which works through repetition and through really careful structuring which feels totally natural um yeah all the things i really love in writing um like kind of structure and voice are just like superb it could be kind of like a downer i suppose like because it's quite negative like she's on a downward spiral for a lot of the book um but like sometimes just like in the way that life is as well things are going really badly for her but she kind of her her hope starts to go up and you end with a sort of positive feeling even though things are actually not materially any better in fact they might be worse um but yeah like it's just her sort of very human spirit and uh, like the way that she's navigating life and the sort of the mundane life but with all of its pitfalls and the sense that the pitfalls could actually be you know fatal or like disastrous um but still she's going through it and she's not giving up is um kind of hopeful as well this so it could be um, optimistic or pessimistic depending what kind of person you are I think and depending on what you you put into it and what chapter you read as well because some of them are pretty grim but um yeah that is Territory of Light at Tsushima Yuko and that was my list of best books of 2023 so let me know uh, if you've read any of these if you're interested in them or if you've got like any other great books that you'd recommend uh, based on what you read or on what you think I might like um, and uh, yeah in the meantime I'm just going to go back to these wonderful library things well these ones are mine i rearranged the shelves in case you haven't noticed these ones are mine and this is library stuff this is uh, vancouver library and this is surrey library but um but yeah like i've just been like enjoying christmas kind of dipping in and out of multiple things 
um, and filling up my brain with Greek myths and uh, Japanese feminism from the like the 1800s and all the good things in life. So yeah, thank you so much for watching. Hope you're having a lovely new year so far and I'll see you in my next video. Bye bye.